There are strange creatures in the forest and they're watching you from the tree line. This world is a strange one. From skinwalkers and werewolves to Wendigo and Bigfoot, there are so many sightings of strange animals in the woods, it's hard not to believe that there's really something out there. Something hungry, something that might just be thinking that people kind of look delicious. Enjoy these allegedly true stories of monsters in the forest. Remember, if you want to hear your story on this channel, you can send me your true scary stories with the links in the description. I'm currently looking for scary stories from the prom. Number one. The Thing in the Woods, submitted by Dark Brave 96 I mainly work the closing shift at the local Walgreens, which is 2 p.m. to 10.30, and being in Minnesota, it gets pretty dark early this time of year. The workday itself went pretty quickly, nothing out of the ordinary or anything that would give me a sign that I was about to have an encounter with something that definitely wasn't human. Anyway, I live with my aunt, and I don't own my own car or even have my driver's license, so usually I just bike to and from work. The route I take to and from the place is fine during the day, but at night, it takes on a different presence entirely. For a little bit of the way, there are street lights and busy roads, but not for very long. The way home is covered in pitch black darkness. I normally just counteracted with taking out my phone, turning on my flashlight, but this night I wasn't as prepared, not like I normally was. Once the clock ticked 10.30, I clocked out of work. I stood outside in the chilly night air and slipped my arms out of my sweater sleeves and turned it around so that the hood of the sweater was in front of me. I always call my girlfriend once I get off work, just because the way home uneases me somewhat, and it feels good to have her voice filling me with comfort. I dropped my phone into the hood, dialed my girlfriend's number, and I began to unlock my bike while she told me all about her day. As I set out towards home, I became distracted by just listening to her talk about something she did at school. So when I got to the point of the route, where the street lights end and the darkness begins, I started to slow my biking pace and I looked down at my hood and began to grab my phone out of it. But suddenly, as I did this, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I felt my body, for whatever reason, go into full alert. My heart was pounding faster and I felt a chill run through me. That's when I tapped on my flashlight app on the phone and I raised the light so I could illuminate everything in front of me. It was when the light illuminated a sickly pale, inhumanly skinny figure that I froze in fear. I watched this creature glance back at me, then it let out a low, guttural growl, and within the blink of an eye, it leapt from the path and into the heavily overgrown woods. This sent my body into fight or flight mode to which I chose to flee. There was no way I was going to stick around and see what this creature was or planned to do with me. I dropped my phone back into my sweater hood and I kicked off the path and stood up as I biked, pedaling as fast as I could, putting my whole weight into it. Though it was futile, as I soon heard the sound of a high-pitched screeching, it was coming from the woods and it was keeping pace with me I could hear those bony limbs thudding to the ground with ease, as if the trees and bushes and just nature itself was merely an illusion. As it began to chase me, as if it was on a hunt, I pedaled and pedaled faster and faster until I couldn't push the bike to go any harder. It took only a few minutes at my pace to clear the forested path to which I heard the creature's movements stop and the night grew silent again. When the encounter was over, I thought, I heard my girlfriend's voice snapping me back to the world. Her voice sounded panicked and worried. I told her about what had just happened 
and she just sort of ignored it, saying I was probably just tired and imagining things. I didn't feel like arguing. I know I didn't just imagine it. Didn't just imagine seeing a creature, hearing its growls and screeches as it hunted me. There's just no way that vivid of an encounter could have just been my imagination. I wasn't crazy. After a while of just talking about random things, I managed to get calmed down. I was about halfway home at this point, so I'd be home in a good 15 minutes. At this point, the path just cuts through this hilly field. As I got closer and closer to that area, I noticed a rather odd smell, a scent that just didn't belong. There were no human buildings around, no restaurants or anything like that because it wasn't a bad smell. It smelled very much like fresh blueberry pies or waffles. I don't really know how to describe the scent other than just a very fresh blueberry smell. It filled my nose coming from the direction of the woods, which was way on the other side of the field. It snapped my mind back to the creature I had encountered. Just staring into the woods freaked me out enough. I felt my hands tighten against the handlebars and I snapped away from the tantalizing scent and I began to bike away faster, pushing my body and my bike harder. I ended up making it home in half the time. I put my bike in the garage and I quickly walked upstairs to my bedroom. I logged into my laptop and began to Google urban legends as well as paranormal stories about the area I live in but nothing really described the encounter I had. As the days passed, I began to push the memory of the event back in my mind, and I didn't think about it until just yesterday. For me, yesterday was Halloween. It was 10.30 at night when I felt that same sense of fear and dread, the same feeling of the night of that encounter. I slid my laptop off my lap and I stood up off my bed and walked over to my bedroom window. My blinds were open and so was the window. As I stood over it, I froze. Off in the distance, standing by a tree, which was roughly 10 feet away from the house in the backyard, I saw the sickly pale body of the creature and then I saw its face staring up at me. I felt as if it was staring deep into me, sensing my fear. Hurriedly, I closed the blinds and locked the window, and I crawled into bed. I began to play random YouTube videos, trying to get my mind as far away from that fear as possible. As I typed this story, I can't help but pray that that was the last time I'll see that creature. Number two, the Wendigo of Press Forest, submitted by Tofu. The story I'm about to tell you is pretty recent, merely a few weeks old. I'm 17 years old with quite a bit of background in cryptozoology and a decent understanding of the natural world. As such, I have quite the fascination with the mundane, such as forestry, environmental sciences, conservation, and preservation. Because of this, I found myself going with my class to an overnight workshop in Eagle River, Wisconsin called Trees for Tomorrow. The workshop in itself was fantastic. It showcased many skills a forester may need, despite everything that was put into practice I knew. Everything from wood cutting, tree identification, and approximate cords per acre were put into practice. We were also taught navigation with a GPS and compass. However, it was during the compass navigation when everything went south. Now, I'm a pretty avid outdoors person. I've been hunting for seven years of my life and romping around in the woods as early as I could walk. Coupled with my insatiable curiosity of the world, I've taken it upon myself to know where I roughly am at all times. This led to me having an incredibly accurate internal compass, along with an acute gut feeling that could tell me if something wasn't right. And after you hear this story, that might just be the reason I'm still alive today. 
Now, let me tell you about our mission. As a group, we were to navigate to several trees scattered throughout the forest, using only our compasses and a rough map. I was the only person in that group who knew how to use a compass, besides an underclassman from my school, named Blake. Blake was a slow worker. He knew how to work the compass, just it took him some time. As for me, I found this unacceptable, and I romped ahead of the group, unwilling to wait for my slow teammates. It was this arrogance that would later get the best of me. So I ended up going ahead, picking my way through the trees and undergrowth, using my overconfidence to make my way through the forest. My first mistake was, in fact, listening too intently to the instructions and ignoring my internal compass and gut feeling. I used the compass as directed, holding it out in front of me parallel to the ground, dialing to the correct number, then putting red in the shed whilst following Fred. This is a rhyme we used often to depict the degree number you wanted to go. I'd made it to the first tree with little difficulty, but it was much more than 300 paces on the next route when I found myself way off target. I immediately dropped my compass to my side and headed back to the previous tree through thick brush and saplings. I went onward with my group as they had managed to catch up when I had backtracked. Then the red flags began to show up. I was walking around 10 degrees to the southwest to where Blake's compass was pointing and I stubbornly ignored their track and headed on my own. It wasn't long before I found myself traveling further alone, keeping my eyes peeled for the tree with the mark on it while also keeping an eye on my compass and waypoint. I was shaken from my track when I heard my group call out to me. Apparently on their own, they'd found the tree and I was the one behind. I was irritated. I scowled and followed their voices to meet up with them, and we resumed our trek together. But I felt this very dark feeling in the depths of my stomach. Why was my compass acting up? I didn't have anything metal on me to cause any interference, and the soil in the area was not metal rich. In fact, it was sandy soil. I checked over my compass and person for any interference. I once again fought my better judgment and followed along with my compass's trail. But with every step I took, I felt a growing feeling of uneasiness in my gut. Yet I ignored it and persevered. After stumbling into a little clearing, now very much unnerved, I took a bearing of my surroundings the forest was getting thicker and thicker in the direction my compass pointed me to, and confusion sprouted in my chest when I heard my name being called from that same direction. How was that possible? I would have heard my teammates stumbling through the brush if they had just come this way. My name was being called still, continuously, and I was looking at the map as I shouted I'd be right there. I made small steps in that direction, while checking my coordinates. Still, they insisted on calling my name over and over. But the most recent call made me stop because I realized something. They were all calling me in the same pitch, same tone, same order. As I listened, they called out again in the exact same way. This is when my alarm bells went off loudly in my head and my mind could only think of one thing, Wendigo. You see, I was no stranger to cryptids, and growing up I've heard many a story concerning the Wendigo and how they often mimicked human voices. Of course, when I thought that, I shook my head. That can't be real, I thought. Even still, I found myself terrified and I stopped in my tracks. This still didn't explain the compass, why was it acting up like this? In my hesitation, I was alerted to a faint call coming from roughly 100 degrees to the northeast. I gazed into the seemingly endless sea of trees and my frightened mind visualized what could be beyond them, a creature of a Native American folklore and nightmares. Thinking that a creature that couldn't be explained by science was just beyond the veil of green, it shook me. 
Then, scarily, I began to feel morbid curiosity. Whatever was beyond those trees knew I was aware of it. The air gave me the impression like the creature was chuckling to itself. I wanted to turn and run. I felt like a kid again, scared of the dark, but it was broad daylight. Then again, another part of me wanted to go, wanted to see what it really was, to see if it really was this Wendigo that I'd always been afraid of. The contradicting feelings that fought inside of me came up to a boiling point when I heard another faint call. This time I could tell it was from my actual group, the other kids. I snapped myself out of this trance. I gave one last glance back to the dense woods before moving on, and I severely regret it. Out in the distance, within the sea of trees, I saw a hairless, human-like head peeking out at me, a face I'd never seen before, a face that scared me more than I thought possible. I ran back to my group. I felt a tug in my stomach, nagging at me every step of the way. I couldn't mention this to anybody in my group because they'd probably call me crazy. When I rejoined them safely, the effect seemed to carry on with me because now everyone's compasses were seemingly going haywire. The next thing we knew, we were desperately struggling to find the next tree. Luckily, it wasn't too long before an overseer came to help us out, but when he looked at his compass, it began to act up a little bit as well. This led us all on a wild goose chase in the area. He knew where the tree was, roughly. When we fanned out in the area, I found the luring feeling curling up in my gut once more, that morbid curiosity mixed with nightmarish dread. I kept wanting to go back in that direction where I'd seen that thing, yet the other side of me knew that was crazy. It was like a game of cat and mouse. I hated it and enjoyed it at the same time. Suddenly, the overseer called us back and immediately I felt this disgust for myself that I was even tempted to head back in that direction. Whatever hold that thing had on me it was gone, and I couldn't be more relieved. Soon we were walking out of the woods, back to the bus, but that tugging feeling never completely left me, as if the thing had strings in me and was pulling me back like some puppet. I would be back though, but I wouldn't be allowed the freedom to wander the next day. I would be confined to my group, but nevertheless, the desire to see that creature again tugged at me. Even as I think back on these events, it makes my stomach curl up in knots. Something wanted me to go into the woods, and I feel that same something wants me to walk out my own door and get lost in the forest. It's tempting to make this nagging sensation go away, but I know better. For now, I just have one thing to offer you, unless you have a morbid curiosity. I'd recommend not following the bad feeling in your stomach because chances are you might never leave the woods. Number three, the thing we saw that day, submitted by Brad. This story takes place up in Panguitch Lake up far in the woods where my dad and I have our own family cabin. A little background. Originally, I'm from Vegas, and around that time during the spring break of 2014, we went up to our family cabin for a fishing trip. It would be for the whole weekend, so my dad said I could invite a friend. I decided to invite my good friend, Hunter. It was an early Monday morning when we set out to leave for the cabin. In all, it was about a seven hour drive I slept for most of the car ride there. By the time we reached the cabin, it was nightfall. Hunter and I got out of the car and grabbed our bags to take inside. We were so tired that we just dropped our bags and crashed on the couch. My dad, of course, took his bags into the first room of the cabin and slept on the bed. The next morning, Hunter woke me up. 
He asked me to go explore the woods with him since he had never been out here before and this kid loved to go exploring. I was tired, but eventually I gave in. We started our journey into the woods as we quietly stepped out the cabin door. The door creaked and I was hoping not to wake up my dad. Once we were sure that he was still in bed, we set off and began walking through the woods. The whole cabin was surrounded by trees. The tree line began about five meters away from the cabin. As we were walking, we were about 20 minutes down the tree line when Hunter said, dude, I've got to pee, give me one sec. I laughed and said, already? It didn't help that at that point, the forest seemed to be sketchy. For the first time in a while, the place was kind of creeping me out, the way it was so silent, but I figured it was just a morning thing. Maybe the birds would be up later, chirping away as usual. Hunter went off behind a tree, and as he did, I started to whistle one of my favorite tunes. Then all of a sudden, I heard a twig snap directly in front of me where I was facing. At first, I was really confused, wondering what it could be. I didn't really think much of it, just thinking it could have been some kind of animal or the twig fell off of the tree. I turned around, facing directly towards Hunter, who just got back from doing his business. So, you wanna head back, he said. Yeah, I replied, trying to hide my enthusiasm for the idea. It was so eerie out there, I was ready to head back. As we began walking, I heard the sound again, snap. This time, it came with a growling noise coming from directly in front of us. I'd never gotten chills from a sound like that, at least not that fast because I didn't recognize the sound of this animal. It wasn't like the growl of a dog or a cat. It was more like the screeching of metal against sharper metal. And that's when it revealed itself. It was on all fours, and it was pale and skinny, down to the bone and flesh. It had scrawny arms and really thin legs. It reminded me of something you'd see in a video game or a children's horror book. I was in shock, I couldn't move. It let out another horrible screeching noise. Hunter turned to me and grabbed me by the arm, screaming, run! I snapped out of it, and we ran as fast as we could back to the cabin. But all the way, I could hear it behind us, getting closer and closer. Don't look back, I said, and we kept running. I felt like my lungs were going to give out, but somehow I managed to force myself to keep running. We got back to the cabin and I slammed the door and locked it as fast as I could. Hunter and I were both in tears. This was the most intense and scary experience we'd ever been through. Hunter glanced over at me and asked, do you, do you see it? There was a stutter in his voice. I looked out the window, but there was nothing. No sign of anything, everything seemed normal. We just sat on the couch and I looked over at Hunter. We can't tell anyone about this. They're not gonna believe it. It's better if we just don't, I said to Hunter. Okay, dude, I completely agree, he replied. But what was that? Hunter, I... I have no idea what that was. The rest of the trip was very hard to enjoy. Every night we'd get back from fishing, we'd lock the doors and double check them. Then we'd close the blinds. But on one night, we heard tapping at the window. Yet the two of us remained still, pretending to sleep, our eyes closed, but all we could focus on was the idea that that thing was out there. I don't know what we saw that day. I'm just glad that Hunter grabbed me and shook me out of my little trance. The thought that really scares me though is what it would have done if it had caught up to us. Were we food to it or were we just its toys? It's that kind of thought that keeps me up at night even still. And number four, it followed me home submitted by Hector.
I live down in South Dakota, in the wooded parts of the place, and I'd like to think that I know the area pretty well. I have one dog and that's about it. On a daily basis, I just wake up, make a cup of coffee and eat some breakfast, the normal stuff. But on this particular day, it was like no other. I'd been invited to a birthday party at my friend's house. I got a text from Mike that day. He told me to be there in five if I could. He wanted to show me something before the party started. I got my keys and jumped in the car. It was about 2.30 p.m. and I had barely started leaving my driveway when an awful smell smashes into me. It's faint, but it's still pretty bad. I assume it's a skunk, so I cover my nose and I leave my driveway. But as I do, Mike texts me again, saying he's already at the house. I put my phone down and began concentrating on the road. But again, the smell gets worse, way worse. It smells like decaying fish mixed in with duck feces. It then began to diffuse throughout the entirety of the inside of my car. Now covering my nose didn't even work. The smell is so bad it's bringing me to the edge of tears. Not seeing where I'm going, my car hits something something big and hard. I slide off the road and stop. I think I just hit a person and I begin to panic, unbuckling my seatbelt and opening the door. My car was fine and had only slid a few yards off the road. Then I looked back in the middle of the road, trying to find what I hit, only to see the decaying carcass of a fully grown bear. Before I can think it was my fault that I had just killed a poor bear, I walk over to it and immediately I realize it wasn't me that took this animal's life. It had definitely perished from something else. The eyes were gone. It was ripped open and some of it was missing. It looked like it had been dissected, not hit by a car. I stumbled backwards, thinking of what kind of animal could kill a bear like that and why it would dissect the body in such a way. Then the smell comes back full force. I hunch over and throw up, and as I do, something growls at me. It's a low growl, coming from maybe 20 yards away. It growls again, but this time its voice turns into a scream. It's both human and animal-like, like a pig's whine and that of a cat's hiss. I turn around, looking for my car, I was so nauseated and afraid that I almost forgot where I was. I run over and jump inside. I lock all the doors and sit there, not even turning the car on. Then I hear this clicking noise and then something crashes down onto the roof of my car. I nearly soiled myself when I heard that. I turned on the car rapidly and I slammed my fist onto the horn, trying to scare away whatever this thing was. Then I floored it away from that scene, not even daring to look back at whatever it was. In half my average time, I make it to my friend's house. An incoming call vibrates my phone, making me jump. I was definitely on edge after that. It's Mike. I answer the phone to hear a, hey, where are you at? But I don't reply. He asks one more time. You there? Where are you at, man? I finally say something. Uh, I, I, I got lost. My voice was shaky, and I can tell he knows something is wrong. I'd been here before, and it was only five minutes away. It's not a drive that anyone gets lost on. Oh, uh, well, we'll be there quick. He hangs up the phone, and then I set the phone down. A few minutes later, and I'm in Mike's house. We say the usual hellos, and then I see my other friends outside in the backyard. One of them is Dylan. Mike takes me to the back and shuts the glass door behind him. I look at Dylan not even saying hello, but I can see he's scared. This freaks me out, because even Dylan doesn't get scared that easily. I ask him what's up, and he points over to the trees. I don't know what I'm looking at, but then I can see just a little bit of the forest. Whatever it was was blurry at first. I could just see shadows, but then my vision focuses 
There are dead animals lining the tree line, as if something had been stacking them to make an arbitrary line, or maybe a border. After experiencing what I just experienced, and because the rotting smell returned, I began to cry and break down. Dylan looks at me and so does Mike. I didn't want to stay out there any longer. I practically threw myself through the glass door and rushed inside, pulling my friends with me. I began to tell my story of what had just happened before I came here. But before I can finish, the doorbell rings, followed by laughter. I know it's more of my friends and I rush to the door. It's Samuel. He looks panicked. I was about to ask him what's wrong when we suddenly hear something on the roof. There's a slow and steady creaking sound coming from above us, and the rotten smell is as strong as before. It was almost impossible to breathe. I, I can't, Dylan whispers. Then the creaking stops. We sit there, not breathing, partly because we're afraid and partly because it's almost impossible. Now, I want to say that after that, something crazy happened. But no, the sounds didn't come back and the smell quickly faded. Eventually, more people showed up for the party and everything was normal. When the party was over, I had to go home. I dreaded driving back, but I forced myself to. I pulled into the driveway and quickly went inside. Then feeling exhausted, I laid myself into my bed. I shut my eyes, but then I heard something from just outside a deep and heavy breathing, breathing that wanted to be heard. And all I could do was sit there, afraid, and listen to it. There you have it. Four poor souls who sighted something bizarre and creepy in the woods. What do you think of it? Do you think these creatures exist? Do you want to see one for yourself? Or do you think it's something else, something natural that they're mistaking for a monster? One thing is certain, if I was in any of these situations, I would need a few more pairs of pants. Good night. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. And don't forget to send me your own true scary stories with the links in the description. Thank you. Stay safe out there and stay creepy.